Hi, I'm Chris Robertson, Master Instructor for Best Incorporated. Today I'm talking about the changes made to the J-Standard 001 Requirements for Soldered Electrical and Electronic Assemblies from Revision G to Revision H. The newest revision of the J-Standard 001 was released in September of 2020. As with all revisions of IPC documents, there are typographical updates and corrections throughout the document. This video will focus on the technical or substantive changes to the J-Standard 001. While the first change we'll talk about is more editorial in nature, it is one that bears reviewing. The ISS International Space Station icon that previously preceded paragraphs that were different between the J-Standard 001 and the J-Standard 001 space addendum has been removed. This does not change the relationship between the two documents, it simply removes the icon that may have caused questions by users of the document who did not apply the space addendum criteria. As of the recording of this video, there was no officially announced release date for the Revision H001 Space Addendum document. Stay tuned for more information for when that document will become available. The use of the words lead and lead can be confusing, especially for a document reader with English as a second language. An editorial change is the use of the element abbreviations when referring to lead, lead-free, and tin alloys. Lead becomes PB, lead-free becomes PB-free, and tin becomes SN. This is a welcome clarification for many users of the document. Next, we move to paragraph 1.5.3. Magnetic windings, high frequency, and high voltage information have all been moved into subsections of 1.5.3 specialized technologies. There are no substantive content changes, but the move indicates that the document committee recognizes that all these areas are specialized and will require agreement between the manufacturer and customer for the acceptability of those assemblies. Skipping some editorial changes, we next move to the Terms and Definitions section. Here we find a new term, 1.8.1, Circumferential Solder Separation. The term is defined as an internal void in the solder fillet extending around the entire circumference of a plated through hole and lead or wire. There is no continuous solder between the solder source side fillet and the solder destination side fillet. When a through-hole connection is x-rayed, a circumferential solder separation is seen as a solder fillet on the source side of the connection, then a solder fillet on the destination side of the connection, but there is no flow through the solder filling in the hole. A typical cause of this condition could be applying solder to both sides of a plated through-hole. This definition is also related to the new appendix. Appendix D contains X-ray guidelines. We'll see more about that appendix later in this video. Another new term is in 1.8.5. The term engineering documentation is used throughout the document to replace the much more cumbersome drawings, specifications, technical illustrations, or other documents. Several of the changes we see in this revision seem to be in the interest of a more succinct document. Moving to 1.10.1, there is a subparagraph added that addresses a question posed by the industry. The question seems to be, is it really necessary to have a certified individual carry out our non-destructive evaluation? The answer from the J-Standard 001 committee is, no, an individual does not have to be NAS 410 or other non-destructive certification for the evaluation of electronic assembly X-ray images. The NAS 410 is a certification of personnel who will be carrying out eddy current, liquid penetrant, magnetic particle, radiography, ultrasonics, and other similar testing. These methods are not typically used in electronic assembly evaluation, so the certification itself doesn't usually apply. Finishing out paragraph 1 of the J-Standard 001 is content addressing ESD. This is not new criteria, it was simply moved to the general section as it applies to all of the electronic assembly process. Paragraph 2 has renumbering and editorial changes with the addition of a few documents referenced in the criteria. Paragraph 3 had many additions in the form of process control requirements from other sections of the document. The move makes sense since the process control requirements apply to the materials and equipment used in the manufacture of the assemblies. A minor addition to 3.2 sends the user to JSTANDARD 005 for solder paste requirements. 
in addition to 3.2.1 solder PB free is one the manufacturers should be aware of. There is now a requirement for class 2 and 3 manufacturing processes to have a documented procedure that provides controls to minimize the risk of cross-contamination between PB and PB-free products or processes. Another significant addition is found in 4.4, Thermal Protection. A new requirement has been added for all classes that if a soldering heat source such as an iron tip or other manual soldering device makes contact with the termination of a heat sensitive component that the component shall be discarded and replaced with a new component. I asked the JSTANDARD 001 committee leadership about this change as it could mean big changes for the installation of multi-layer ceramic chip capacitors. The leaders responded that there would be a classification and possible exemption for components such as the MLCCs. Until then, any issues or questions can be directed to IPC through the contact page on their website. The second part of the new addition in 4.4 is that the same thermal precautions apply when manual assembly modifications such as jumper wires or the addition of a component to the same land as a heat sensitive component. The next change we see is that inclusions in the soldered connection has been added to Table 4-1, Solder Connection Anomalies. Inclusions can be anything that should not be present in the soldered connection. Just in case you're wondering, inclusions are a defect for all classes. 4.17 and 4.18 are new sections in Revision H. 4.17 adds threaded fastener criteria to the process verification of JSTANDARD 001. The content appears to be the same criteria used in the IPCA 610. The same is true for the torque requirements now in 4.18. On to paragraph 5 and the wires and terminals connections. A general note for section 5, wire overlap, where the wire wraps the terminal more than 360 degrees and overlaps the previous wrap, has been removed from the individual terminal criteria. Instead, there's a general statement in 5.4.1.4 that states any wires that cross over or overlap themselves or other wires is acceptable for class 1, but it is a defect in all cases for class 2 and 3. Staying in 5.4.1.4 for the moment, there's also an exception for wire wrapped opposite to the wire dress. The leader wire shall continue the curvature of the dress of the leader wire. If the wire is wrapped in the opposite direction, then it is acceptable for class 1, a process indicator for class 2, and a defect for class 3, except when the wire or terminal connection is supported to prevent stress at the solder connection. The addition of the staking or some other form of support to the connection means that the wire wrap direction is optional as long as the wire is supported. 5.4.1.5 is now insulation sleeving. There is a further breakdown of insulation clearance in relation to the base spacing of the terminal. When there is more than one wire diameter distance from the bottom of the terminal opening and the surface or other potting on the base of the terminal, then the insulation clearance shall be less than two wire diameters and the insulation must go past the solder connection. When the distance from the bottom of the terminal opening to the surface or potting is less than one wire diameter, then the insulation clearance has to be less than one wire diameter. The balance of paragraph 5 is mostly the same as are the criteria in paragraph 6 through hole connections. Paragraph 7 has some notable additions and changes. The first is in 7.5.4, criteria for square side terminations or 1, 2, 3, or 5 sided chip components. The criteria is the same as what's in 610, so this is likely a synergy alignment for the two documents. The same side termination criteria has been added to 7.5.5 for the round cylindrical components, more commonly known as MELF components. Moving to 7.5.7 .7, flat gullwing leads, some consideration and breakout of criteria have taken place. Revision G had a breakout of the minimum heel fillet based on lead thickness. Revision H has consolidated this back into a single criteria regardless of lead thickness. On the other hand, the maximum toe overhang has been broken out based on lead length. With a longer lead, with lead length greater than three times the lead width, toe overhang is permitted as long as there's no violation of minimum electrical clearance. 
For leads that have a total length less than three times the lead width, class two and three do not permit toe overhang. With shorter leads, there's less area to make the connection. For class two and three operations, it's necessary to have all of the short leads on and soldered to the pads. In revision G, flat lug leads and flat unformed leads were in a combined section. For clarity, these two items have been broken out into individual sections. Flat lug leads, such as power dissipating, solid leads are in 7.5.11, while the criteria for flat unformed leads as occur on flexible circuits that will be soldered onto the lands of a rigid board have been moved into section 7.5.21. Bottom termination components, BTCs, criteria had previously been left to as agreed between the user and manufacturer. Revision H updates the requirements to say, when the criteria has not been established, the soldered connection shall be larger than 50% of the thermal plane wetting area. Failure to achieve 50% of the soldered connection is a process indicator for both classes 2 and 3. Another modification to the BTC criteria is where revision G left the toe fillet height as unspecified or variable as determined by design. Revision H adds that this dimension criteria has not been established. This seems like a very minor change, but it does have a significant meaning. Revision G left the criteria as not specified, meaning that as long as there was no detriment to form fitter function, the toe fillet or lack thereof was acceptable. In revision H, making the criteria not established means that the net manufacturer will need to have customers specify what the requirement is on these soldered connections. On 7.5.16 bottom thermal plane terminations, also known as DPACs, a relaxing of the criteria for the end overhang of the thermal plane has been added. End overhang of the thermal plane is allowed as long as all other criteria have been met. The committee received and reviewed data that showed end overhang is not a failure mechanism when observed as a solitary anomaly. 7.5.19 in a new section for criteria with vertical cylindrical cans with outward L-shaped leads. Pictures and illustrations of this type of termination are located on the page adjacent to Table 7-22. This section begins with the note that the criteria assumes an inspection process is established, either visual or x-ray evaluation. Any portion that is visible shall meet the requirements of Table 7-22. Just like area arrays and all other components that have non-visible connections, process validation and verification can be used in place of x-ray or visual inspections. The criteria itself is nothing out of the ordinary for similar lead shapes. Another new section for wrapped terminals has been added to paragraph 7.5.20. This criteria is illustrated well in figures 7-22 through 7-24 and illustrations in figure 7-25. This type of connection is made by a wire wrapping around a supporting element that is then metallized over the complete wrap. The criteria are again in keeping with dimensions for other small connection types. As mentioned earlier, flat, unformed leads have been moved to 7.5.21. The criteria for this type of termination remains mostly the same as it was in Revision G. The big benefit in Rev H is the illustrations and other figures. These provide a much better visual reference for these types of connections. Paragraph 8 had remained unchanged for a number of revisions until an addendum was passed for Revision G. The addendum was a complete rewrite of the cleaning section of J Standard 001, and it has been incorporated into Revision H. Section 8.0 of J Standard 001H begins with criteria requirements for a qualified manufacturing process. Paragraph 8.1 requires a documented cleaning process that results in acceptable levels of flux and other residues. Objective evidence shall provide documentation that the hardware is not adversely affected when in the service environment. Rework processes must also be included in the qualification documentation. Paragraph 8.2 and its subparagraphs address ionic process monitoring, including requirements for a sampling inspection plan, control limits, and the reaction when the control limits have been exceeded. If changes to the process are made, subparagraph 8.3 and its subparagraphs establish required requalification actions if the change was major, defined in level 1, or minor, defined in level 2.
Sections 8.5, Visible Residues, 8.6, Non-Ionic Residues, and 8.7, Ultrasonic Cleaning, are similar to Revision G, but a review of these subparagraphs will be necessary for users of Revision H. Finally, subparagraph 8.8 .8 gives recommended documents for the guidance in the elements of a J Standard 001 with respect to residues. Next, moving to section 10, we find that some of the criteria has been moved to paragraph 3. The remaining content has been organized, but remains largely the same requirements as in Revision G. All of Revision G paragraph 12 inspection method methodology has been moved to other locations throughout the document. What was previously paragraph 13, rework and repair, is now paragraph 12. The good news is that there were no significant changes to the rework and repair requirements. Appendices A, B, and C all remain unchanged from revision G. There is the addition of Appendix D, X-ray guidelines. The first paragraph of Appendix D states, With increasing frequency, the IPC task group developing the J-Standard 001 has been asked by document users to provide content related to the use of X-ray to inspect through-hole solder connections that are not visible by any other means. Limited requirements have been added to the J-Standard 001. Appendix D is a compilation of applicable through-hole X-ray guidelines and does not include requirements. In summary, the industry asked for guidance on X-ray evaluation of through-holes, and the committee provided it in Appendix D. If you carry out X-ray of through-hole components, take a look through this content. Some significant changes and quite a bit of reorganization has been completed on Revision H of the J-Standard 001. Users of the document should complete a thorough review of the changes to ensure that the assembly processes meet the requirements and can be proven as a capable process. I'm Chris Robertson. Thanks for watching. Visit and follow us on our YouTube channel, Soldering Geek, for more videos. For training classes, supplies, and more, visit our website, www.solder.net.